Okay guys, welcome to uh, another uh, Rated What. This week we're looking at the software house Melbourne House. Now Melbourne House, uh, they originated um, in 1978, obviously based in Melbourne. They started out um, known as Beam Software and then eventually became Melbourne House. Now they brought out a lot of games. Um, I mean some of their sort of best known games would obviously be stuff like Wave the Exploding Fist, uh, Rock and Wrestle, Castle of Terror, um, Fighting Warrior, Gyroscope, loads loads more. Um, they produced a lot of games. So anyway, listen, I'm just going to stop talking and let you just enjoy some uh, C64 music with some of the adverts. Okay, this is ARG. This was released in 1989, and if I remember rightly, I'm sure this was actually released as an arcade game, and this was actually a port of that game. So anyway, let's take a wee look. Right, now, I don't know what the hell that is. Is that some kind of cannon? Okay. Alright, so you can actually fire and breathe your fire in all directions. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do here. I actually thought it was a one and one and beat him up. But apparently not. Is it like rampage? Have you got to try and set stuff on fire? Right now I'm guessing he's little oh what happened there? Was that it? I'm not quite sure what happened there. Yeah. 
Nee, en dan heb je de bij. Ik weet niet wat ik niet zelf stok. Nu is er ook wel sure wat I'm supposed to be doing hier. I'm guessing it's a kind of late rampage where we've got to try and destroy stuff. Right, I'm really not too sure how this works. Am I trying to get into the... Oops, it looks like a bird has just done a big job on me and I'm dead. Anyway, yep, yeah, that is ARG and that was released in 1989. Okay, this is Asterix and the Magic Cauldron, released in 1986. And this is on the Commodore 64. Now, Asterix was one of these cartoons. Um, it never really took off in the UK. Um, I think it was more was an Italian type thing, I'm not too sure, but there were some cartoons I think um, in the sort of 70s in the UK, but in the main Asterix was never really a cartoon that was particularly big. And if I remember really, is that Obelix? I think mean, that's the, the big sort of stout chap. Right, it seems to get a draw the... Ah, you know what, I was, I was just about to sort of criticise it for the time it takes to draw the graphics, but it's actually quite pretty. When you see there, you know, you're walking in front of stuff, but then you're also walking behind stuff as well. That's actually quite clever. I don't ever really recall seeing a game on the C64 that had that sort of graphical style. Absolutely no idea what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, it could get slightly um, annoying when it's constantly making you draw the graphics, but quite impressive. Whoops, what the earth? We're in some sort of fight. Alright, okay, I think I managed to kill it. It's almost as some sort of tiny adventure type thing. Let's see if we can fight this. This boat, here we go. And he zooms in. Punch and kick, punch and kick. And he turns into some. Is it ham? I'm not too sure what it is. Anyway, listen, that's enough of that one, guys. That's uh, Asterix on the C64, released in 1986. Okay, following the success of The Hobbit, um, they brought out Lord of the Rings. And this came out sort of four years later, in 1986. Now again, this is obviously a graphical... I'm calling it a graphical adventure. It's a text adventure, yes. Yeah, a text adventure with graphics, that's what it's called. Right, which Hobbit characters do you wish to play? Let's go Frodo. Ah, so it's kind of got graphics a wee bit. You're in a comfortable burrow with her. Ah, right, so this is kind of similar. There's a round window and a green door to the east. Near is a door. And near the door is a large heavy wooden chest. Against one wall is a kitchen dresser. In the kitchen dresser are a drawer and a cupboard screwed to the wall as a notice board. Covering the notice board is a group of photographs. Pinned over the group of photographs is a note. You can see Sam and Pippin. Pippin waits. Sam waits. Talk to Sam. You talk to Sam. Pippin waits. Sam waits. Let's try and open door. Oops. Open door. Open door. You open the green door. Now, I don't know what is the east. You wait. Pippin waits. Sam waits. We all wait. East. You can tell it's always a bit more advanced because there is a bit of a delay in sort of when you type. It can you have to think about it. 
You go east, you are in a sunny, well-tended garden to the west as a burrow with a green door. Right, anyway, listen, that's enough of that. That's uh, Lord of the Rings, and that was released in 1986. And this is on the spectrum. Okay, this this game le- needs absolutely no introduction. That is, of course, uh, a way of the Exploding Fist, probably the most iconic game released, certainly in the sort of 8 bit era. This is the Commodore 64 one, this is the game that I played an awful lot back in the day. Now, it still looks, even now, I think it still looks amazing. It looks and sounds amazing. Now, most C64 owners would always say that International Cry is the better game. Now, it may well be the better game, but I've always liked the graphics of this better. I mean, this game did come out before International Cry. such a good game. <laughs> Obviously it was famously uh, criticised because you, you could apparently beat the game using the leg sweep. But the thing is this game wasn't about high scores, it was about sort of getting to the higher levels. So, leg sweep, that was a leg sweep, yep, apparently you can just do that right the way through. Oh, he's got a full point, let's just use a leg sweep, yep, that'll... There we go. I'm now up to... First and... He got in first. But it's a brilliant game, it really, really is. You can punch the ribs. <laughs> now I have a mate who is into martial arts, he's been into martial arts all his life, and he actually said that this is actually quite a realistic representation of karate. You know, it didn't have all the stupid kind of moves that sort of later games had. Oh, is he going to get a full point? Oh, it's just leg sweep just to keep him at bay. See that he's starting to walk. But the, the sound of the music in this world, not even just the music, the actual sound in the C64 version is just absolute top notch. Punching the kidneys. And it's game over. Yep, anyway, listen, that is Way of the Exploding Fist, and that was released in 1985, and that was the C64 version. Okay, this is Rockford, the arcade game. Alright, oh, press fire to continue. Now, again, this was one of these games. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's based on Boulder Dash, but this was one of these games that actually came out on the Arcadia system. The Arcadia system was basically Amiga hardware. It was basically an Amiga in a, an arcade cabinet. So it meant that the games that you could play on your Commodore Amiga were the games that you were actually seeing in the arcades. The 
funnily enough, the game's called Rockford, but oddly the little character that we all know and love as Rockford appears to have completely disappeared. Bollocks. And to be replaced by some noxious little uh, human character. fairly well, but you know, it is only Boulder Nash after all, it's not exactly a particularly taxing, uh, taxing arcade game. Oof, that were close, Gov. And that's enough of that. That's Rockford the Arcade Game, and that is on the Amiga, released in 1988. Okay, this is Hampstead. This was uh, released in 1984, and this is a. Uh, I don't think has it got any graphics. I don't think it has actually. It's just a text adventure. Now this was obviously out in the mid 80s when yuppies were alive and kicking so there was very much a, a sort of a social divide um, and this is obviously looking at the posh people down in London. Now I've actually got a wee cheat mode set in this particular version. Apparently if I just press enter it automatically fills, uh, fills it in so let's, let's batter on and see how, how it plays. You know, if the game is to attain Hampstead, ah, right, okay, so it's to actually attain some wealth. You start at the very bottom of the social ladder, your aim is to get to the top by any means. It's Thursday and time for you to sign on, but first make sure you're decent. <laughs> get UB40, okay. You're in your bathroom, a cracked wash basin that contains the remains of last night chicken vindaloo and chips. Not a pretty sight. Right, so. Just pressing through all this is going to eventually solve the game. You're in a social security office. A slow moving queue shuffles towards the only working clerk. Time passes. Yeah, Melbourne House did go on to make quite a few text adventures. Quite a few of them. Uh, they weren't just text, they did have sort of accompanying graphics. So anyway, listen, I think that's probably enough uh, of a text adventure, let's uh, batter on. That was released in 1984, and that was the C64 version. Okay, this is Rock and Wrestle, uh, and this was on the C64. Now, it was known as Rock and Wrestle, and certainly in the UK, but it was known as, was it Bop and Wrestle? I think it was elsewhere, I'm not quite sure why they insist on changing names and things, but anyway, this was kind of the unofficial, um, unofficial sequel to Exploding Fist, that was before the official one came out, um, because Exploding Fist did so well when the same programmer brought this game out, people thought it was going to be brilliant, and you know what, it got pretty much panned for the graphics, I got pretty much panned by all the reviewers, but you know what, actually looking at it now, yeah, the graphics are very blocky, um, it actually plays pretty well, considering, so let's see, when do we start, this is the F7 to start, Okay, I'm playing the sort of the yellow dude. <laughs> Come on, get up, you fool. I've got no idea how you get up. Am I even playing this? I'm not quite sure. Let's 
try again. Oh, I'm certainly controlling it there. Yeah, I see it might be controlling it. I think what kind of let this game down was just because the graphics are so blocky, but actually when you look at it now, it's actually not too bad. There's not a lot of frames animation in the game, but it's still quite good fun. Although I could have completely lost the ability to actually play the game. <laughs> anyway, listen. That's Rock and Wrestle, and that was released in 1985. And there's Frankie Goes to Hollywood, obviously, taking part in it as well. Right, anyway, let's uh, move on. Okay, this is Obliterator. Um, this is on the Amstrad CPC 464. Um, this was released in 1989. So this was obviously one of the sort of later games to come out. So let's go Joystick Zero. Graphically, this is very, very nice. Very colourful. Oops, a daisy. He didn't want to do that. Oh, you know what? I've just sussed. Right. It's got the same controls as a. Uh, so the same controls as a uh, barbarian. It's kind of icon driven. So what I want to do before I die? If I can figure out how to pick up. Right, it's probably not the easiest game in the world to control using the joystick. Right, I can run left and right, no problem. <laughs> yep, so pressing up and down it sort of changes between all these different icons. But what I'm trying to do here is figure out how to pick up. I'm guessing that one is stop. Don't know what that one is. That'll be jump, is it? Is that jump? Yep, that's jump. That'll be fire or punch, attack. I don't know what that does. Don't know what that does. So what I want to do is try and pick up the gun. So we we'll go along here and we we'll go, is it that one? It would certainly help if that thing wasn't killing me every two seconds. So, that one is it? Maybe? Up? Well, that'll make you clean ladders, I'm guessing. Let's just try and run. It's okay, you've failed in your mission, you've, you're dead, and the earth is doomed. Yeah, that would certainly take a wee bit of practice, that one. But anyway, that's nice uh, graphically. So that is Obliterator. And that was released in 1989, and that was on the Amstrad. Okay, this is Starion. This was released on the... I think it was released on the ZX Spectrum, Amstrad and C64. But this is probably the best one. This is on the, the Spectrum. Now, how do we start it? I remember playing it on the C64 and it was pretty crap because the Commodore, unfortunately, could just not do... It just couldn't do uh, vector graphics. Right, I'm not quite sure. Am I actually controlling this? really not quite sure. Was it using keys? Ah, right, okay. It 
appears to be using keys, which I cannot, for the life of me, use. Apologies about that, I was trying to pause it and figure out how we could actually... Right, so what is going on here? Right, that seems to fire. Okay, I've got that. And that turns the sound on and off. <laughs> right, I'm really not sure. Oh, wait a minute, is that the keys here? No, that's not, is it? Pitch D. Is that the keys here? X for roll. I think I might be actually, but I still can't figure out how I actually move. Right, and listen, I'm not doing a very good uh, display of this game. But you need to, need to trust me on this, it's actually a really, really stonking the uh, vector. Can you shoot him up? I think you've got to shoot ships and they basically drop layers and you've got to try and build birds or something like that but I'm not doing a very good job of actually to let you see how the game works so anyway I'm going to stop it now guys but that game is an excellent one that's a starry one and that was on the ZX Spectrum released in 1985 Okay this is Road Wars and this was released in 1988 and this is on the Commodore Amiga Let's see F1 to start Get ready, go. Now this game... This game was actually... Um, came out in the arcades. Um, Mastertronic decided to sort of license um, the hardware, the Mega hardware, and bring out some uh, arcade games. And they're basically running using the Commodore Amiga, and this was one of them. I remember thinking it looked quite impressive, but it didn't really do that well. So basically the version that you were getting on the Amiga was the version that was in the arcades. Yeah, it was called Arcadia Systems, that's what it was, Arcadia. But the games were all pretty pish. I think, uh, was it, there was a darts game as well, that was another one that just came out. Let's try it once more. Let's see if I can actually figure out what I'm supposed to be doing. Right, so I see it be the ball on the right hand side. Oops, so easy. I've got absolutely no idea what I'm doing here. <laughs> right, anyway, yeah, it's a lot of cash. That was Road Wars, and that was on the Commodore Amiga, released in 1988. Right, this is Gyroscope, and this was released in 1985, and this is on the, the Spectrum. It did also get released on the other 8-bits, the Amstrad and Commodore 64. So, let's see. I always felt that this game looked and played a lot nicer on the Spectrum than it did on the C64. This was obviously out at the same time as Marble Madness. Now, I remember Marble, Ma sorry, Marble Madness was getting ported. Oops, there am I going? Marble Madness was getting ported and it was about to get released. And along came Melbourne House with this effectively stealing the thunder. Am I trying to get to be I've got to say, it actually controls not too bad, considering. I mean, Marble Madness was controlled using a, a trackball. Right, okay, we've heard the music, let's move on. Space. Right, you've got to press space bar. Right, come on, mate, get up there. Oh, 
bollocks. Don't give me a bite to begin again. Hold it together, hold it together. Oh no, no, no. Right, come on. Ah, oh, we go. Let's go for one more go. Ah, can't wait. But this is actually quite a, a visually impressive game. Maybe it's just the graphics make it look better than this, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> right, anyway, listen, that's enough of that. That is a gyroscope. That was released in 1985 and that was on the Spectrum, that one. Okay, this is Street Hustle, released in 1987. Making good use of expanded sprays. <laughs> In fact, they're probably about the biggest sprays I've ever seen. I yeah, like that's a nice wee effect that actually when you have the whole screen kind of shakes. Somebody in a fur coat. I think it is a monkey actually. Ah, so each enemy has got its own energy bar. I'm not quite sure what the hell that is. We'll pick that up. Right, now that looks like he's trying to tickle the guy's feet. Or is it trying to trip him up or something? I'm not quite sure. And it's kind of like Double Dragon, where you've just got to kind of keep trying to advance forwards. Or when I say forwards, I mean left to right. <laughs> but yeah, the sprites, though blocky, are actually quite impressive looking. I mean, they're, they're pretty huge. That's him dead. Tickle, tickle, tickle. Tickle, tickle, tickle. Oops. Cool. Well, that seems to floor the gorilla at least. <laughs> yeah, anyway, okay, that's Street Hassle, released in 1987, and that's on the Commodore 64, that version. Right then, this is Penetrator. Um, no giggling at the back, thank you. This is Penetrator, and this was released in 1983. And if I remember this really, I'm sure this is a rather funky, is it, scramble game, I think. How do we start? and it's not going to be joystick controlled. Oh, it is. There we go. <laughs> yeah, scramble. Now, I've got to say, this is the first time I've ever actually played this game. I know it's, uh, there's a lot of people rave about this game. I mean, it's a very, very early game. Obviously based on scramble, which was in itself one of the first great arcade games. Wait a minute. It's 
just dawned on me, you can't, you can't seem to shoot straight ahead, ah, or can you, you got to use spacebar possibly, no, that's interesting, oh wait a minute, ah, now I managed to shoot straight ahead there, how did I do that, you got to press it to the side or something, See me figure out how to. Look, I did it there. How did I manage that? No, it's got me. <laughs> it seems to randomly shoot up. Strange. But yeah, this is excellent. Really, really nice. That is excellent, that is Penetrator, and that was released, by that was Beam Software, that was before it became Melbourne House, and that was in 1983, and that was on the ZX Spectrum. Okay, this is a way of exploding Fist 2, or to give it its proper uh, title, it was just known as Fist 2, or Fist 2 The Legend Continues. Now, you know, the first game, Square Exploding Fist, was a massive game. Hugely popular, and it was one of my favourite favourite games of the C64. It's an absolutely brilliant game. And when they announced that we're going to be bringing out a sequel, that was kind of going to be like an adventure with the same sort of graphics and sort of beat, you know, fighting style. Um, myself, along with a lot of people, were very, very excited. And unfortunately, this game just never really met. It didn't really. I don't know quite what it was with the game. Um, it's actually quite a boring game. The thing is, the game came. I was going to say it came with two sides. It actually came with two games. You had this, which was this sort of adventure. But on the B side, it was basically similar to the first Fist game, where uh, you just fought one and one. But you had a big massive energy bar, which meant you had quite a good kind of you know, fight. I mean the first exploding fist was all about points, so it could be over really quickly, but the second, uh, the fighting game and the, the reverse of this game, had uh, big energy bars, which meant you had really sort of some good battles. But yeah, this was just, it was just quite disappointing. moving, you're pressing the fire button, it's kind of jerking away there, I'm not quite sure why I did that, but it just always, I always felt it looked kind of unfinished. So I don't like that as well, when you're kind of scrolling, it stops. I'm just going back the way I came, I think I have. Spectrum, I think it also came out in Amstrad as well. But yeah, it was just, it was disappointing. It was sort of hotly uh, awaited, but it just never really, oh, it just never really, it just didn't uh, tick the boxes. It 
was disappointing to say the least. So anyway, listen, that is Fist 2. And that was released in 1986. And that is on the Commodore 64 album. Okay, this is The Dark Tower um, on the C64. Programmed by one Robert Henderson and it was released in 1984. Now, I've never ever heard this game before. So let's. Now, did it see price up to start? There we go. Right, it appears I am playing the part of a potato without any face, but it does appear to have some legs. does look very, <laughs> very manic minorish, even down to the wee baddies. Oh, bollocks. So how did I get down here then? If I can't... Oh, right, I can jump down there. So I need to jump when he's moving that way, like so. Yeah, there we go. Oh, wait a minute. How can he jump? All the way from there. And he survives. Yeah, he can't... He can't fall down that wee bit there. That just doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> ah, box! There's always a reason I can't remember this game. See, now you can jump in there, no problem. And yet you can't appear to walk off here. Which just makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Now, is he going to survive this? Technically he shouldn't, because that level looks like it's actually higher than another one. <laughs> right, you know what? That's enough of that one. That is The Dark Tower. That's on the C64 and released in 1984. Okay, this is the iconic Horus Goes Skiing. It's probably iconic for different reasons. Probably not because it's a brilliant game. It was certainly one of these games that was always on display in shop windows. Um, now, the reason it features here is because it was written by... Um, it was written by Melbourne House. I think it was Bean Sofit actually, which is what Melbourne House were called originally. So let's see if we can actually play this game. I'm guessing it doesn't have joystick. Right, how do we... <laughs> right, okay. So Q and Z. I just need to figure out what keys move left. <laughs> so easy. What keys move left and right? Ah, are you okay? I've got you. Oops. Let's go for another game. Oops. It's not easy. Especially trying to play with keys. No money, no ski. Oh, so it was borrowing. Oh, it was borrowing quite a lot of uh, frogger. We were going with this, we're not even going to see the skiing part. You may just have to take, take my word for it that there is actually skiing in this. What makes it difficult is you can't see me stop, you're always moving. <laughs> go, go, go. 
go, go, go. Ah, boys. I don't think you can move diagonally either. Ah, arse. Right, anyway, listen, you're not going to see the screen part. You just have to go into Google and or go into YouTube and watch it for yourself. So that was Horus Ghost Skiing, and that was released in 1982, and that was on the spectrum. Okay, this is Double Dragon, and this was... I mean, it is classed as a Melbourne House game, but it was obviously released uh, in the UK by Master Tonic. Oh, let's see how we can start this. Right, okay. He appears to be separated from his... Uh, in fact, all the graphics, all the sprites appear to have... Uh, their upper torso appears to be detached from their lower torso. Now, I think Melbourne House were one of these companies where they did... They did license a lot of games um, from other companies, and obviously they licensed their own games to other companies as well, this being an example. I don't know if that little glitch um, is down to the emulator, or is that, uh, is that how it was in, when it came out? I'm guessing it probably was. I'm assuming you could have, in fact, I'm sure on the title screen, it gave you the option for two players. Anyway, listen, I'm not going to spend any more time on that. That's uh, Double Dragon, and that is on the C64. Okay, this is Knuckle Buster. This is very distinctive, uh, Rob Pepper tune. This was released, uh, when was this released? This was released in 1986. Getting this game, I'm not very excited about getting it. And I'm inversely being disappointed with the game. I just felt it was a bit naff. I mean, I'm really not sure how I'm supposed to. Is that my energy? Getting zapped? I think it is. Yeah, it just it looks nice. Game over. Yeah, it looks and sounds nice until it starts moving, then it just all seems a bit, I don't know, uncontrollable. You know, you run and these guys run right beside you. I have no idea how you're supposed to actually. Kill them. So I'm guessing I completely forgot to actually play test this game. And it was getting made. And it looks nice, but ultimately it just feels uh, Yeah, anyway listen, that's not one of their best. I mean, that was one of their later games. I'll well, see a later game in 1986, but yep, that is a knuckle buster. And that was on the C64. Okay, this is Muggsy. And this is a. It's. How do you describe this one? It's not a text adventure. It's kind of an adventure. It's like graphics, but you just basically make decisions. You don't really type stuff as much. Okay, let's see, see how you boss is. Love of your sidekick here with the lowdown on the mob. Yeah, the graphics in this were really nice and it's got a wee bit of animation as well. Yeah, so this game is kind of more like a... Mm, you've got to kind of make decisions, you know. You, you've got to type in various things, but you don't type in sort of commands as such. So, so the mob now contains 40 level hoodlums. 
Now this game was quite famed for its uh, some of its kind of graphical set pieces which were quite nice. We protected 300 of your last foreign clients, that was a bit quick for me, but the cops really listened and took 75 grand from our safe boss. You've got 670,000 bucks. It costs one grand to put the squeeze in each client, the godfather made the rule that our gangsters each get one client to protect for themselves. This year we can buy or sell clients for 19 grand each. How many do we want to buy from the syndicate? Let's go for 30. As you know, boss, that leaves one hundred one so one hundred five thousand bucks in the safe. How many grand are you going to give the boys for artillery and ammo? Let's give them ten. Gee, boss, boys is going to be hopping mad. You sure got guts. We've got three hundred ninety clients in your protection. How many do you want to put the squeeze on? Let's go for one hundred thirty-four. We've only got ninety-five. A year goes by. Yeah, and this is one of the yeah, you see there, that's really nice. Absolutely no sound I don't think to speak of. Nope, oh, tell a lie. <laughs> Last year, 40 guys got robbed out by other mobs, and Ohoods was recruited by the organisation. City Hall thinks you stink, boss. So the mob now contains zero level hoodlums. Is that game over? Me and the boys is getting out pronto. What a schmuck you are, Muggsy. Okay, right, no, we're not playing our game. But anyway, that is an excellent game. I just can't play it too well. That's Muggsy, and that is on the ZX Spectrum, released in 1984. Okay, this is Castle of Terror. This is a sort of a graphical adventure, a graphical public text adventure, um, released in 1984. Um, I have done a feature of this one before. This is a the game itself. I wouldn't say is a particular favourite, but I absolutely love the music in this game. It was the music that really, really made it. See if I can remember. What do you do here? Anybody under the age of probably 25 is probably wondering what the hell is that he's actually doing. This is called a text adventure where you actually have to type in the command so you didn't have a 360 control and move you actually had to type the direction so in this case N for north and on many occasions I wouldn't actually understand what you're actually trying to do Back in uh, 1984. Just going back to the game. Anyway, listen, this is Castle of Terror, and this is on the C64, released in 1984. Okay, this is Fighting Warrior. Um, this is on the Spectrum. This one was released in 1985. I think the game was also ported to the, the Commodore 64 and probably Amstrad as well. So let's take a wee, wee look. So we're going to go for Kempston, number 4, and 0 to start the game. Now, 
I'm sure this game actually played a lot better in the Spectrum as it did in the, the C64. The Commodore one just looked very blocky. Now it's one of these games that's got really nice graphics, but I think it's ultimately very, very, very repetitive. Hmm. I don't think there's a lot of moves. I'm going to get one more hit, one more hit, and he's dead. Duck. Yeah, I mean, the actual graphics of the baddies looked really, really nice. But like I said, I think the actual game itself was pretty boring. Excuse me. Oh, jump. <laughs> yeah, it's not the most intuitive control system in the world. Come on, how do I actually, you know what I'm... And it's game over. Anyway, yeah, that's enough of that one. That is a Fighting Warrior. I say that was released in 1985, and that was a Spectrum version. Okay, this is one of the most iconic games released by Melbourne House. This was, of course, The Hobbit. This was released in 1982, so it was one of the very, very early sort of computer games. Now, this is a graphical adventure. Yep, here we go. You basically type all your commands and using the keyboard and you've got some wee graphics to sort of depict roughly where you are. Now I've got to, I've got to put my hand up and see I have never ever played this game. I maybe played it for maybe played it once on the C sixty four but I was never a, a fan of these kind of games. Oh here we go. You're in a comfortable tunnel lake hall to the east there's a round green door. You see the wooden chase Gandalf is carrying a curious map. Thorn Gandalf gives a curious map to you Thorn says hurry up Take map, look map. I didn't like that. So yeah, you basically just typed in your commands. Let's try and go north. You cannot go north, south. Open door. The door is open. To the east, right? We need to go east. There we go. You're in a gloomy, empty land with dreary hills ahead. Look, oops, you're in a, uh, to the west, there is a, a round green door, visible exits are east, north, blah 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 blah. Let's go east again. You're in the Trolls Clearing. Oh, look, that looks like some kind of pot. You see the hideous troll. The hideous troll is carrying the large key. Thorn enters. The hideous troll says, Blimey, looks at this. Can you cook him? The vicious troll says, You can try, but he wouldn't make a mouthful. Let's try and hit. Troll. Witch troll. Witch troll? <laughs> Ah, this was a vicious one, so let's do Hid how do you spell hideous hideous You attack the hideous troll but the effort is wasted, the defence is too strong. Thorn says hurry up, the hideous troll attacks you. With one well placed blow, the hideous troll cleaves your skull. You're dead, you've mastered two point five percent of his adventure. Well that was quite easy. Anyway, yeah, listen guys, that is that one, that is the Hobbit. And that was released in 1982, and this is on the Spectrum. Okay then, this is the very last game we're going to look at. This is Doc the Destroyer. This is on the Commodore 64, and it was released in 1987. 
J for joystick. I don't know anybody who'd actually ever use a keyboard in a C64 game, but anyway. Alright, okay, so I can take. Right, I get you. You can basically change what you want to do. Right, let's like just bar on you. You fight the warrior. Press a key. Are <laughs> you okay? So it's a beam up then. With its expanded sprites and all its glory. Right, I've got absolutely no idea if I'm actually... Oops, I appear to strike a blow there I think. Graphically this is actually quite nice, I know it's expanded sprites, but the, the graphics look nicely detailed and the animation is pretty good as well. It's just a pity that appears to be completely devoid of any gameplay, although that's probably just me. Never a fan of games that just have music playing, I like to actually be able to hear what I'm doing. By all means, have music in the background, but don't have it place of spot effects. You need to be able to hear what you're actually doing. And it looks like I've just had my arse whipped. Let's go for one more go. Let's go for, let's take luck away and charisma away and intelligence and let's just go for strength. And endurance. Hard as nails, obviously. If I don't win this bout, there's something far wrong. But I can actually see where. Is there some sort of energy meter? Is it the red thing at the right hand side? I'm really not too sure. It's changing. Yeah, it looks like the wee red thing at the side's going down, so am I going to kill him soon? One more go. Hooray! He appears to have evaporated. Right, I've got absolutely no idea what happened there. Was that game over? It looks like it was. Anyway, listen guys, that is enough of that. Um, that sort of finishes off our look at Melbourne House. I mean, going through the list of games, um, it's just incredible how many games they actually released on the 8-bit machines. Um, and because they obviously started out as Beam Software, they were making games really from 1982. I mean, there's, there is a lot I mean, I'm looking at a list of C64 games here, and there's 115 games listed, which were published by Melbourne House, and then there was about, I don't know, 50 odd in the spectrum, and about half a dozen, or sorry, a dozen or so in Amstrad, so they certainly made a lot of games, and um, a lot of them looked pretty naff, but, uh, you know, they obviously went on to sort of, they brought out some iconic games back in the day, and they obviously went on to continue making games, um, so anyway, listen guys, that is it. I do hope you enjoyed watching it. Please feel free to like, comment and subscribe. If there's a particular software house you want to see featured in this uh, feature, then put your comments below and I'll certainly see what I can do. But as usual guys, thank you very, very much for watching.